Drum rolls, please. With this painting and this artist, we get ready to leave this unit and, with a break for Art of the Americas, to enter the world of modernism. I'm going to spend more time than usual on Monet because he's such an important transitional figure and also because every once in a while we really need to slow down and enjoy learning more about a work and a painter. So this painting is not our required work by Monet. I'll get to Olympia in a minute. But the luncheon on the grass is too important to art history and too much a precursor to our required work for me to skip over it entirely. Monet entered three works in the Salon of 1863. The Salon judges rejected all three, and no surprise, the judges rejected two-thirds of the paintings submitted that year, including paintings by Courbet, Whistler, and Pissarro. The rejected artists and at least some of the French art viewing public raised such a howl that the leader of France, who by then was Napoleon III, took the unusual step of opening a salon de refusé or a salon of the rejected. Note the salon was government sponsored. Napoleon III was very eager to showcase France's role as the center of culture. Okay, I can't resist a digression. This is the Whistler painting that the Salon judges rejected. Whistler was a leading American realist painter, and this became one of his most famous works. After Luncheon in the Grass, it was the number one target of ridicule at the Salon de Refusés. Go figure. So I couldn't figure out which Pissarro painting the Salon rejected, but here's a painting from the right year. Pissarro became an important impressionist who didn't make our list, but in this painting, we still see the influence of the Barbizon school of plein air or outdoor painting. The rejected Courbet painting depicted drunken priests. The person who bought it destroyed it, probably bought it in order to destroy it. We have only this photographic reproduction. This painting, on the other hand, was the hit of the Salon of 1863, and there's a smaller version hanging in the Met. So what did Salon judges and Paris art lovers expect from nudes? Well, they expected soft, rounded bodies with careful modeling. They expected averted eyes. And they expected allegory. Nude goddesses, yes. Nude ladies sitting around in the park with fully clothed gentlemen and a story that doesn't seem to make any sense and the people still puzzle over? No. This neoclassical painting is not a required work, but it did once show up on an AP exam, and I think it's interesting from a sociological, if not necessarily an artistic point of view. The Queen of England, that was George III's wife, had dispatched a German painter to Florence to paint the gallery, which was a precursor to art museums. Note that the aristocratic men are gathered to admire the, the art, most notably the painting in the bottom center. Do you recognize it? That's Titian's Venus of Urbino, right? Here, women are definitely objects of observation and desire. They're subjects of painting, but they are not shown as painters or even like the men pictured as art connoisseurs. Feminist art critics often refer to what we see here as the male gaze. And we'll talk about this more in our last unit. So it's hard to blame Monet for refusing to imitate the 19th century equivalent of a penthouse centerfold. But he was heavily influenced by earlier renditions of nudes, including Titian's. Here we see nudes cavorting with men in modern dress. This was modern for 1510. But they're nymphs, so it's okay, right? And they sure don't look us in the eye. The woman who served as Monet's model for the nude with the forthright stare was also his model for our required work, Olympia. So let's learn a little bit about her. And this brings us to another famous homage to Titian and our required work. In this work, Monet is almost certainly representing Victorine as the wealthy mistress of a wealthy French bourgeois. And she doesn't look especially ashamed about it either. Or does she? What is the expression on her face? What is she thinking? Critics at the time found her gaze disturbingly forthright or defiant. What do you think? Well, I think she probably is forthright and defiant, but to me, she also seems sad, maybe even a little trapped. And what's with that ribbon tied around her throat? It's almost a metaphorical guillotining. Monet almost certainly chose the title of the work to be deliberately provocative. French courtesans often took classical stage names such as Venus or Olympia. 
But Olympia was also the name of an especially famous courtesan from history, Olympia Maldicini, the sister-in-law and quite possibly the mistress of Pope Innocent II back in the 1640s, a woman so powerful that she was nicknamed the female pope. Historians still argue over whether she was in fact the pope's mistress, but the French viewing audience would have known the rumors. Still more digs at the church. The black maid scandalized the public as well. Unlike Titian's maidservant, she features prominently, although her Face does blend into the darkness. So why is she there? Some critics think she's a deliberate foil to Olympia's whiteness, maybe even a shout out to the stark black-white contrasts of that new medium, photography. But other critics observe that the racial theory is so popular at the time, a perversion of Darwin's theories of survival of the fittest, some races were fitter than others, uh, that these theories associate people of color with bestiality, primitivism, and, of course, sexuality. So here's an interesting observation from an art blog. The black servant's presence underscores the fact that the courtesan, that's a word for a fancy prostitute, unlike the streetwalker or common wench, unfancy prostitutes, exercises control and dominance and may even insinuate or imply that those who yield to her charms are as subordinate as the black servant girl. Monet's painterly style also attracted criticism. So here's a quote from Princeton University art history professor Anne McCauley. The paint sat there on the surface of the canvas. It wasn't just the fact that she's a nude and she's a lower class nude, but also the fact that she was painted in what many people read as almost childlike or unskilled fashion. Note the contrast with our Academy Venus. Those brush strokes virtually disappear. But is this loose brush stroke really an innovation? Or does it remind you of any of the painters we've studied? What about Velazquez, whose paintings Monet deeply admired and actually copied to hone his skills? Or Rembrandt? Or Delacroix? Or Turner? Um, let me share another observation about his oil painting style that I found in Paul Johnson's uh, History of Art, which I've referred to before. Monet introduced an important change in oil painting. The practice at the time was to begin with a dark underlay and then build up lighter tones on it using opaque layers of pigment and then translucent glazes. Monet was an accomplished watercolorist, and he preferred the technique of putting on the lightest tones first and then putting in the darks. He applied this to oil, reversing the usual sequence. Uh, or alternatively aiming for what is called an a la prima effect, that is coloring from the start the tones he wanted at the finish. This was a momentous change in oil painting, for it was far quicker than the old method, making outdoor work much easier, and it led inevitably to a higher range of colors. It made the canvas look slightly unfinished, but also fresher more, as it were, up to date. Uh, I find Johnson very interesting. He's really a historian and a journalist, uh, but he's also an amateur artist and the son of an artist, and so he has insights that I, alas, do not. Notice, too, the relatively flat rendition of Monet's Olympia, much less modeled than Titian's Venus. Monet's dark and light tonal separations may reflect the influence of the new medium of photography. I've mentioned this already. So one art critic I read noted, I quote, in this painting and luncheon on the grass, light shines forward from the viewer's position. Lighting professionals sometimes refer to frontal lighting as flat lighting because it has certain peculiar effects. Shade concentrates at the edges of the forms. Light areas bleach. Surface textures and details are suppressed, and backgrounds go dim or black. To us, this actually seems rather ordinary. We look at photographs more often than we look at paintings, so we're used to frontal lighting. But it's one more reason why Monet's works would have startled the 19th century French public. Now, I came across this late 19th century photo of a Hossa woman from what is now South Africa when I was Googling Monet Olympia photography. The photography blogger noted the resemblance to Olympia and also that, and I quote, commercial photographers in the colonies sold their images to eager audiences in the home country, often as postcards. All too often, 
as you can see in the postcard above, that's this one, representation of female others seamlessly blended ethnographic curiosity and sexual voyeurism. But this photographer uh, goes on to observe that there's not a hint of submissiveness or inferiority about her, that is the woman in the photo. Even if, as seems quite likely, a photographer familiar with Monet's work had deliberately put her in this pose. Anyway, back to my point about lighting, the sheen on our African woman's face makes the frontal lighting quite obvious. Olympia's flatness may also reflect Monet's interest in Japanese woodblock prints, which were coming into fashion at the time and also tended to flatten pictorial perspective. The painting on the left is Monet's portrait of the realist a novelist Emile Zola. In Zola's studio, we see a woodblock print, a sketch for Olympia, and a sketch of Velazquez's Bacchus tacked to the wall. Uh, and here's a better look at the woodblock print. This is a so-called floating world print that you may recall captured the lives of elegant courtesans. Well, that was way back before Christmas. We'll return to Japanese woodblock prints when we talk about the Impressionists. Interestingly, Olympia did make the cut for the Salon of 1865, where it was met by outrage. The Salon organizers actually decided they needed to rehang it higher because they were afraid of vandalism. Pregnant women were warned not to look at it. And the painting was not, as you can tell, well received. One critic at the time described Olympia as, quote, a courtesan with dirty hands, wrinkled feet with the livid tint of a cadaver displayed at the morgue. Here are a couple of lithograph characters published at the time. Gotta love that cat. And here's our new friend Daumier's character of a family viewing Monet's Olympia. Although I wonder if what's being caricatured here might be the bourgeois audience that was so easily shocked. So let's watch a brief clip from a video by an art critic we've encountered before when we were looking at Islamic art. He has an interesting take on why the public was so offended. See if you agree. I'll close with another famous Monet painting and another commentary on gender roles in 19th century France. Monet shows us a beautiful young barmaid arrayed with all the other items that are for sale to the prosperous men of the French upper middle class. Check out the mirror behind her and the man who is ogling her. The male gaze again. So we've come a long way in this unit from Fragonard's adulterous aristocrat on the swing or halfway.